The Incubate Club podcast is intended for mature audiences. I know we're usually talking about kids' cartoons and stuff, but there's going to be naughty language. Uh, anyway, uh, listener discretion is advised. Yeah, man, I don't know why I watched that fucking Raggedy Ann movie last night. <laughs> I was fucking tired. And I like I started watching it and I'm like, all right, I'll turn this off after about 10 minutes. I watched the whole goddamn thing. You're listening to the Ink and Pain Club podcast, a proud member of the Geekly Grind podcast network. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Ink and Paint Club podcast for this week. My name is JD. My friend's Kyle and Matt. Hello. We're all here. We're together again. And it's, it's, a, it's a good thing. It's beautiful. Yeah. We're, we're uh, hanging out. We're, we're talking about fucking cartoons and shit. Yeah. And... We are talking about James and the Giant Peach, uh, Henry Selleck's hybrid stop motion film from 96. Uh, it's 25 years, right, Matt? Yeah, 25th anniversary. And then I looked, I, I looked after the fact, and it's actually, um, I think the book originally came out in 1961, so it, the book is celebrating a 60th anniversary like in July, I think. So. Well, there you go. Yeah, celebrating two different anniversaries this year. How uh, how familiar are you guys with uh, Rod Dahl's uh, body of work? What was that, Kyle? The very. A very? You grew up like reading a lot of his books. Yeah. I never like. Yeah, I don't know. It was just never in like the rotation, like my school or uh, my parents weren't really aware or anything. Like I didn't. I didn't really read a lot. My familiarity with it was just the the movies, like you know, between this and um, Willy Wonka and Matilda and stuff. Those are really the only ones I knew. But yeah, I, I never got around to reading like the actual books. Yeah, I um, I didn't read any of the books. Um, I like knew of who he was because he was like introduced like as like a children's author. Um, but it was weird because. Like you, Matt, I was um, familiar with a lot of the movies based on his works. But like as a kid, I didn't know that they were all like all the original stories were done by the same person. So like Willy Wonka and Matilda and this like it wasn't until I was a little older that I realized they were all like his stories. So, yeah, Um, yeah, I think it was probably not right around when uh 2010 when like fantastic mr fox came out because then that's another one that's an you know that's one of his that's oh his fuck book. i um, forgot about that yeah um i'm sure it was sometime before then but that was definitely when i started to take notice um because yeah there's that and then uh i think the witches is like another like cult favorite movie that i know just got another adaptation like as an actual show i think recently oh um, yeah and then of course uh, disney did um uh, the BFG, the big friendly giant, yeah. like some years ago. Yeah, Kyle and I were talking about that before we. <laughs> the big fucking got on. guy. <laughs> yeah. Everyone said it was terrible. Really? I I didn't hear. I don't even remember hearing anything about it. Hey, anything. Anytime I heard someone bring it up, said it wasn't very good. But oh, you know, well. can't all be winners. Yeah. Um. I know it was like, like I think a couple of years ago now, but like, I know Netflix announced that they were like planning on uh doing a bunch of adaptations of his work like i i'm not sure if they were all animated but i know that like a good chunk of them were supposed to be like um i know there's gonna be another adaptation of uh charlie and the chocolate factory that's gonna be uh, taiki watiti i think okay so i was was literally about to say do we really need another adaptation story but taiki watiti i kind of trust him to make it interesting so yeah, I mean, I don't know. I'm I'm one of those people that will defend the. Uh, well, yeah, it's actually uh, ties in too because you know this is uh, Tim Burton produces, but you know Tim Burton did you know his version of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory in the 2000s, and uh, I mean, weird. I like it. I I mean, but you know, it's I, I it's, it's just compared to the original. The fucking in Jim my Wild defense, Girl. I've literally only watched that movie once. I don't know. I, I there's a lot of stuff that I that I enjoy about it. Like it's, it, it does have problems, but you know, it's fucking, you know, it, right. it is, it is what it is. Right. Um, 
Um, but yeah, so yeah, James the Giant Peach. Um, Burton is a producer on this, but uh, our boy Henry Selleck uh, actually directed it. Much Just like uh, Nightmare Before Christmas. Yeah, and uh, fucking there's a l- there's a little crossover here there that we talked about. Yeah. Which, it, okay, so I, I I'm gonna bring up some stuff throughout this review about like stuff I didn't realize as a kid when I watched this that I kind of picked up now. Um, that the it was really funny because I've known this entire time that like oh yeah they used the Jack model for the for the skeleton pirate, um, in that part of the movie. But I did not realize growing up that when the centipede goes down there and he sees him, he literally calls him a skeleton. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then two seconds later, he goes jackpot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, literally, I've not I've not seen this movie since like the late 90s. So, like, I, I did not pick this stuff up as a child. So I thought that was funny. Yeah, I got to think that was like around the last time I watched it, too. Like, and I thought I remembered a lot more of this movie. Than I actually did because rewatching it, I was just like, I, I totally forgot that it was a musical. Um, I thought the ending, or I remember the ending being completely different. Um, I thought the ants died, although I, later I looked up and apparently they they get smushed by the peach in the book or something. So maybe I just a Mandela affected myself or something. Yeah, um, there, I actually had to go read the Wikipedia for the book to to make sense of a few things in this. <laughs> which what, what, what parts did you need uh, well, made sense well, of well the the main part that i was confused about and like i originally just chalked it up to roll doll nonsense uh the fucking rhino it just like the 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 movie really glosses over that at the beginning it's like and then a rhino appeared and killed his parents i'm like all right um but i i went and read the uh the wikipedia entry for the book and it actually said it the rhino escaped from the zoo and then killed his parents it was like okay that's a little like context that like makes that make a little more sense but then i like you know this movie is all fantastical and nonsensical to begin with so i guess it's not really necessary for a visual adaptation yeah they more so refer to that event like in sort of uh yeah, and like uh, James is like, well, I guess not. He's not hallucinating fucking lightning rhinos in the sky. I guess, I guess all that stuff actually does happen. Like that's the thing too. Like the rhino is a metaphor. <laughs> I guess <laughs> I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't know, man. It's just it, it's wild how much of this that I, I I thought I didn't remember. And it's I, I always wanted to like rewatch it. Like since I was a kid, I just never got around to actually doing it, just because you know there is um. Just so many other like, you know, I mean, you know, animated things, you know, that came out, but also just as far as stop motion goes, I mean, it's been in a pretty good um, place because, you know, of course, back then when it came out, um, you know, it was kind of it's referred to as a flop, you know, it's had a thirty eight million dollar budget and then it made about twenty nine million back at the box office. Of course, that's factoring in like, you know, for home media and stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm sure since then it's, you know. We have gotten them, you know, back some money and stuff. But um, yeah, between this and then like, you know, um, this must have been what? Because the, the, it was after this movie, Henry Selleck's uh, next movie was Monkey Bone. And I think that was in 2001, right? Yeah, I think so. Right. And then, of course, that movie, another live action stop motion sort of like hybrid thing didn't do well. And then he was out of the picture until uh, Coraline. Like, which is you know, yeah, which later. is really weird that like I mean, God bless Leica for taking a chance on him again, but like yeah, after having like two major flops uh in your career to come back and like okay, we're gonna adapt this Neil Gaiman novel um and make a pretty good stop motion movie out of him, like like I said, God bless <laughs> Leica for for letting him do his thing. And it really surprises me that Selleck hasn't done more with Leica because every other production that like has done since then uh, he hasn't been involved in any of it and like because he's like you know integral to like that studio even being like a success you know like if Coraline hadn't have done as well as it did like who knows if like would be where they are now I mean they're like five pictures deep now like yeah they would with that Nike money uh, I mean that's true you know if I could yeah Travis Knight is Nike royalty I think I, I talked 
talked about it uh, on here before right? i met him like at a showing of a uh, uh, box jewels is the, the newest movie at the time they did like a showing in la of all three movies and then they uh uh yeah travis knight was there and this was before kubo came out but it was announced that uh that he was going to be directing that 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 was his first directorial uh picture for like a mm-hmm. but he was there and um yeah, there's the box shoals uh, Q and A and everything afterward, and like it let out, and uh, I I had a brief encounter with Ben Kingsley, and I talked <laughs> to him for about ten seconds before his entourage whisked him away. That's funny, um, but yeah, I got to talk with Travis for um, you know a couple minutes, and you know I was just telling him you know how much I dug like his work and you know stop motion in general, and you know me and him exchanged some words. I took a picture of him, and it was it was really cool. Nice, um, but yeah, no, it's yeah, like I said, it's just strange because I mean. Selick hasn't put out a picture since Coraline. Like I know, well, he's I, got he's I, got that uh, uh, Wendell and Wild. Like yeah, supposed that's what's coming out sometime this year. And I didn't realize this. Um, have you guys heard of the the video game Little Nightmares? Yeah, apparently he was supposed to be directing like a pilot episode for a cartoon or something. Yeah, it's it says that um, he's directing. Um, uh yeah, a TV series of it and the Russo brothers uh from the the Avengers. The, the Avengers uh they're supposed to be producing it. I don't know. It's, there hasn't been any uh updates on it in a while, but I've like I've seen some gameplay of that mo- of that game um and that like would be right up his alley. So Oh yeah, totally. No, I mean I've played through the first Little Nightmares. I haven't done the DLC. I've been meaning to do that cuz I know the sequel for it just came out recently and I wanted to play mm-hmm. through that, but yeah um, that'd be that'd be really cool to see him take on that but i feel like it's it's one of those things where i know that sellers tried to get projects off the ground like in between like it's been big gaps between movies that he's directed that have come out and that's because i know that he's been trying to get on other projects trying to pitch projects but just nobody just was biting like um i know that uh and I, well i know now i didn't know this you know before doing the sort of research on uh, for this episode apparently uh Selick and Burton were supposed to do another movie. Uh, we're supposed to do another movie, I believe, for Disney hmm. um, after James the Giant Peach. Uh, it was supposed to be an adaptation of a uh, Carol Hughes book called Toots in the Upside Down House. But because James hmm. didn't do, you know, it didn't do the numbers that Nightmare did. So they canned it. And then, you know, of course, Burton would go on to, you know, major success. And then Selick would kind of. You know, he went on to make monkey bones. So I, I feel like Selleck made it out better than Burton on that exchange. Well, but I'm a fucking monkey bone apologist. You can listen to our fucking monkey bone episode. Yeah. About that. Of course, you weren't there for that. Actually, sure and actually, now that you're here, and since we're talking about a different Henry Selleck movie, what did you think about monkey bone? Just I, uh, I'm going to be real honest with you here, Matt. I did not watch it. Uh, okay. Well. <laughs> I did not have time to watch it, and then I was really busy. Right, right. Fan, that, that makes sense. I, I apologize. No, that's fine. I, I wasn't no. sure if you'd ever watched it at any point in your life. I think I saw a little bit of it on Comedy Central ones. I've definitely seen Monkey Bone more times than I've seen James of the Giant Peach. There you go. Yeah, and uh, that's just my fault, I guess. I don't know. James is just one of those movies I, I guess didn't get Repl- it didn't get played a lot on television. Of course, not as much. You know, fucking. Of course, Nightmare will get played like every single Halloween or Christmas or you know, Both. right around that area. It's 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 a dual holiday movie. I I went and saw it in 3D in the theaters. Nice. <laughs> Back when they were doing those 3D conversions of all the movies. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. No, I think I remember. I'm not sure if it was the first time they did the 4D screenings of Nightmare. Uh, at the El Capitan in L.A., oh, Jesus. Uh, but it, it was one of the ones they did. I, I went to one of those, and it was cool because they had the uh, they had all the miniatures and stuff right below the building, and like you got to see on the wall in person. Like they had like the hill, and they had like you know Jack and oh. Sally and everything. And it was really cool. Nice, yeah. Um, um, so yeah, we'll talk about we'll talk about the actual movie here. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I, I did want to ask because uh, we've been kind of uh, snubbing Kyle out of the discussion here. Yeah, I'm Ooh. sorry, Kyle. Be- What's your history with this movie? Have you'd seen it before this, right? Yeah, I saw it. I read the book. I, I know a lot about it. The how I much? Know. Tell us. Enlighten us. Was it I, your favorite? I, not really. <laughs> <laughs> what what did you think rewatching it? Did you did you enjoy it as much as you did as a wee bab? 
I mean, I recently saw it within 10 years. Uh, oh, okay. I was buying a lot of Disney DVDs when those were still a thing and probably watched it. Whatever, it's a whatever movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I kind of feel like up against Selleck's body of work, or I guess just anything Burton related to, like this one is, is one kind of like falls in the cracks. It's It's like a weird outlier because it's not as like, it's not as like weird and like spooky as like everything else. Like it's got a weird, it's, it's still got that sensibility to it, but it is definitely different in a lot of ways, even though it is also similar in some ways. Um, one of them being the, 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 we were talking about this, the, the soundtrack, cause it's that Randy Newman score oh, and like the songs okay. and stuff. So yeah, Toy Story and this movie both came out in 96. Uh, Matt and Matt informs me that Toy Story came out first. I think it did. Apparently. It. Yeah. Well, just cause I, I read that the reason why Randy Newman got on this picture at all was because the original composer, his name was Andy Partridge. He was part of a band called XTC and um, he had, comp- he was going to be the composer for this movie. And um, apparently Disney were being, you know, typical disney, disney. about <laughs> typical disney about like compensation and stuff and so uh he'd only written about like four songs before um they decided to part ways or disney might have just outright canned him i guess but then yeah i guess uh yeah toy story had done so well or and i guess that you know people reacted to the the songs and the score in that movie so well that they decided to just put randy newman on this one and i feel and, like man that, this yeah, is a toy story ass uh score <laughs> yeah because I don't know. I'm trying to feel like, you know, cause you come off a nightmare and like, you know, it's a spooky Halloween movie and like, you know, you get the, you know, the, the man responsible for Oingo Boingo to do this, you know, the soundtrack. And so, I mean, of course that's like the first, the film that Danny Elfman ended up doing. And then he would go on to do way, you know, that would score work is like his job now. Like he's not in any bands anymore. That's just his right. job now. Um, And then, yeah, like, I don't know. I feel like I'm trying to think like what this movie would be like with like a Danny Elfman score because it's it's so weird to in my mind to divorce um, Burton and Elfman. But of course, the other thing too here is that um, I had assumed this for such a long time, uh, but then rewatching the movie, I, I, I'm assuming is not the case. Of course, the Nightmare Before Christmas. That's yeah, Burton producing uh, and a lot of his designs and like the story and stuff that's his but here i believe a lot of the designs in this movie is actually it was done by the original illustrator for the um for the novel yeah i mean it does not the design work doesn't look like nightmare no um, but it's got like, a lot of similarity like i mean aside from you know reusing like you know jack like as a as an incidental character in this like i don't know i feel like it still has like and, and i think that's just due to um, Henry Selleck, of course, because, you know, he directed both projects. So, you know, mm-hmm. he's it's not just a case of just the director being the director. I feel like, you know, Henry definitely had, like, a lot of say as far as, you know, the, the visual style of things. Mm-hmm. So you're saying the book that looks like this right here. Is that what you're talking about? Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, yeah, it definitely looks like that's, uh, that's the artist. Behind, that's the artist behind Stinky Cheese Man. Okay, you thank that you. Is. That was bugging me the entire time I was watching this movie. <laughs> what the hell, is Stinky Cheese Man? You've never heard of the Stinky Cheese Man? <laughs> I don't think so. I feel like and, I would have recognized that. Oh man, that book was the shit when I was growing up. <laughs> uh, the Stinky Cheese Man is like it's a it's a take on it's like a like a weird like it's it's basically retelling a bunch of fairy tales in like uh weird ways okay so it's like a it's like gingerbread shrek or man something thing. it's like a retelling of the gingerbread man and then doing different other fairy tales in okay. stupid ways sure, yeah sure. it's, it's the, st- the stinky cheese man and other fairly stupid tales Oh, okay. I, I I do recognize this fellow. So it's a so instead of the gingerbread man, he's the stinky cheese man. Got it. Okay. Can't catch me in the stinky cheese man. <laughs> I wouldn't uh, say that the I wouldn't say that it's inspired by the book cover. Yeah. Well, I I could definitely see some uh, some inspire. I can see some inspiration, especially with uh with the 
uh, the centipede guy because he has like those weird beady eyes um, that apparently Lane Smith likes to draw on their characters. So, but, well, uh, and the other thing too, because you know, just in how I remember this movie looking, uh, but then knowing now that I. I that if Burton just did produce, he didn't have as much of a creative say in this movie as it did with Nightmare, because a lot of the stuff in this movie, like um, a lot of the live action stuff, like the the architecture and like uh, and that sort of thing, like you know how like it's all like you know weirdly shaped and like it, all the buildings are like miniatures that like you know very clearly like not full sized and like you know the weirdly shaped and that sort of stuff, and like there's um. There's like a nightmare sequence uh, sequence in the movie where we're like it's it's two dimensional stop motion where like it's got you know the real James's head like on a centipede's body and it's like colored and like it's you know he's like Terry, it's Terry Gilliam looking. yeah yeah and it's just I I know that that Burton had done some stuff like that like as far as student films or that sort of thing um, but then you have to remember too that I, I believe Selleck and Burton went to like the same art school or something like that, right? Because that was how Burton contacted Selleck in the first place for Nightmare when he couldn't work on it because he was busy with like Batman, right? Yeah, this is all stuff that I found out. Uh, there's a um, Netflix has a series called uh, The Movies That Made Us, and they did like a a, a short like two episode holiday thing, and uh, Nightmare was one of the uh, uh, ones they covered on there, and so there's a lot of cool uh, stuff on there that I had no idea about, so. That one's worth uh, watching. Gotcha. Jeremy Snow here, owner and editor-in-chief of The Geekly Grind. I'm interrupting your awesome, regularly scheduled programming to ensure that you know about our Geekly Grind podcast network, of which this show is a treasured member of. If you haven't had a chance to check out our site, you can do so at www.thegeeklygrind.com. And while you're there, check out the other members of our steadily growing podcast family, including the anime-centric Blake and Spencer Get Jumped, discovering new heroes and comic book keepers with Chris and Lance, exploring the vast universe of geekdom with Geek Exploration, or, of course, appreciating animation's finer details with the Ink and Paint Club. Escape your weekly grind at the Geekly Grind. Uh, but yeah, this um, this movie is... is I, I, I just kind of forgot how weird this, this movie is. I mean, it is definitely in the wheelhouse of Roll Doll, abusive parental figures. Um... And it's like being whisked away to a uh, off into a, like a fantastical setting. Um, it is real interesting the transition that they do between uh, live action and stop motion, and then the eventual uh, bridging of those two. Yeah, no, it's definitely. Uh, I, I and it's weird. Uh, I when they do when they do it at the uh because there's like 20 minutes that you get into the movie and then it shifts into like full stop motion um and then like with 20 minutes left in the movie it shifts back to mostly live action with like intercut stop motion stuff and they're like with the the, the bug characters and stuff um but yeah the the transition out of it was kind of jarring because i i there's shots where like they're it's not like a strobing light effect but it's um you know, there's like coming back on and off and like James has still got mm-hmm. like a stop motion body and like he turns back into like his, his human body. And I thought they're going to use that to kind of like, you know, in between uh, the light shining just to have him, you know, back in that body. But like they do it like mid like light shining on him to like transition him out of it. And I thought that was a weird choice to do that. Um, but then like, yeah, when they when they do like the actual cut into stop motion in, in twenty minutes into the movie, it's like that shot, uh, two dimensional shot of him like crawling through the peach and like uh, his his limbs and like his head like getting bigger and like longer and shit and like yeah, conforming to his his what his puppet body is gonna be. Yeah, I gotta yeah. say, I I I really enjoy all the designs for the, the bugs and like the the characters and everything in this movie. Except for James, I feel like I don't know. I I think it's just the beady eyes. I don't I don't think they look it's like fat head. The fat head is fine. I don't know. I think just because I I, I know mean, it, I, 
I, I think it's just more, at least for me, I think it's just more of like you get to see these bugs in kind of a different way than there would be normally uh, in the real world and have these personalities and like different body shapes. And James is just like a kid, <laughs> a kid yeah, in a suit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but then like I was thinking like on Nightmare and of course that one's more, you know, influenced by like Burton designs and stuff. But I was just thinking like if he had like, you know, bigger eyes, like if he just had like eyes, like I don't know, I feel like I would yeah. like his design a bit more. Um, yeah, um that's, like, speak- a, that's a minor nitpick yeah but uh speaking of the bugs i really liked how and i forgot that this is how they, they did it but i really liked how they introduced them um when james like gets into the peach and like all the um the bugs are like talking in the dark and you just get like these bits of their bodies that are lit up like the you see the earthworms glasses are lit up um the centipedes teeth are, are lit up, but everyone else, but every part, other part of them is in shadow. So you get like these glow effects on them. Um, I just thought that was a really cool, uh, decision, like visually just before that, there's the shop, like before James enters the, the sort of core of the peach where, um, it's like, uh, uh the grasshoppers silhouette, like, or the, the shadow is like, Oh yeah. Uh, when it's, yeah, animated. it's doing, yeah, it's doing, it's yeah. It's doing the, the shadows against the, the curtain. Like the, the yeah, like the oogie boogie shot, like yeah, that was nightmare. really cool. Yeah, no, there's like little bits of like traditional animation here and there, like for you know, like smoke effects and the you know that sort Honestly, of thing. Honestly, there's a lot of different kinds of animation here because you get, you have your, your stop motion, um, you've got your live action, your traditional. Um, there, there's traditional. Um, there is a, a handful of CG animation in this um that did not age well honestly. yeah so can you, <laughs> can you tell me i was trying to determine this uh there is a shot in here where they're on top of the peach and they're trying to like wrangle seagulls mm-hmm. and uh they the lure in the seagulls to the peach and then like james throws like a, a fishnet over them mm-hmm. and like the shot after that is very clearly oh uh, yeah those birds are cj yeah. So the shop. Okay, that's what I thought. But like, yeah, I, those birds are those are those are CG birds. <laughs> and I get it. Like, yeah, well, you wouldn't want to have to fucking animate all that. Like, yeah. And I think some of the shark is CG. Like, I think there's some shots that are traditional, but I think a lot of that sequence is CG. Yeah. What's the um in Banjo Kazooie? What's the uh, oh clanker? The, the, yeah, that's that's what it reminded me of was uh, <laughs> clanker. <bit>. <laughs> The other um, thing too was um another thing that reminded me in that scene specifically where they're like they they've got all the fucking seagulls and they uh, tie them all up with the the spider's web and like they've got them all you know flying up there and like James is wrangling them and um I can't remember the context of the episode but uh, there's an episode of American Dad. And uh, Stan and Roger are like on a deserted island, and I know Roger's like wrangling all these birds, and like he's trying to like get them to lead him off the island, and like he goes and he goes to like go yeah, like you know he's like you know like a horse carriage or something, and like he just yeah. snaps all the birds' necks. Oh no! <laughs> and I was just thinking about that the whole time watching that, which is weird because there's a part where the centipede actually does that, <laughs> yeah, and it that does, was yeah. just this is the whip crack on him. Yeah. Um. Honestly, and I don't know if you guys felt this way too. This movie's actually a lot shorter than I thought it was. It's like um, an hour, ten minutes. Yeah, it's breezy. Yeah, because like, okay, so there's the beginning part where James is with his aunts, and then he gets into the peach. Uh, they have the part with the shark. They have the part with the pirates, and then they're in New York. Like yeah. I thought there, I thought there was like one more thing in there, and I guess i misremembered um but yeah it just seems there's like a there's just like a few uh, adventures across the sea that happened and then they're in new york the book has cloud people in it yeah i thought there was gonna be some more like cloud related stuff because i know that there's a shot there where they're like they're floating through the clouds and like all the clouds are shaped like teapots or something i kind of expected that to lead into like a like a more um elaborate sequence i guess but uh yeah i know that didn't really uh pan out that way i don't know i mean for somebody that's read the book i mean how close is this as an adaptation i know the ants are 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 supposed to die in the book or they do die in the book but is there anything like 
else that's like majorly different or that you can recall? I haven't read this book in 20 years, man. <laughs> oh, I don't know. You're talking up how big of a fucking James and the Giant Peach fan you were. Like, it's your favorite movie and book. I don't know. <laughs> it's not like I fucking dedicate my life to this. <laughs> Kyle, Kyle has a James and the Giant fan page that he updates regularly. Yeah, you can go find it on Angel Fire. It's uh, <laughs> it's on GeoCities. It's not. No, they, the GeoCities is long gone, my dude. Is Angel Fire still up? I don't know. I, I don't know about that. I know specifically GeoCities because I had some fucking GeoCities websites. I never used Angel Fire, so I don't know. <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, the 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 pirate section um, has another bit that I did not catch as a kid. Um, I did not realize that one of the other pirates is just Donald Duck as a skeleton. <laughs> right. Yeah, he's got like the duck bill. He's, he's on got the... the duck bill. He's got his hat. He even sounds like him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm, uh, I don't know. I feel like usually Disney is a bit more uh, protective of that sort of thing because it's a Disney movie. So I mean, I guess you know. No, it, it, I just, I just, no, he's just straight up Donald Duck as a skeleton. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he is a sailor, so I guess it kind of fits. I just, I, I don't know why I never picked up on that. Yeah. Oh man. Um. But yeah, the there. I mean, this there's a handful of like well-known actors in this, not a lot of, uh, of, of people though. Um, cause you got like Richard Dreyfus as the centipede, which surprisingly. And once I realized it, it was very obvious that, uh, voice actor Jeff Bennett is his singing voice. Yeah. <laughs> and it sounds very much like Jeff Bennett singing. Uh, the old, when I looked at the cast list, the only one I really recognized was, uh, uh, Susan Sarandon. As a uh, um, spider, yeah. Susan Sarandon in this. Um, I know who Pete Postlethwaite was. Um, I know he's been in a bunch of movies. I mostly know him from the. Uh, uh fuck. Who did Moulin Rouge in the Gatsby movie? Oh, Baz um, Luhrmann. Yeah, uh, yeah. He was in Baz Luhrmann's uh Romeo and Juliet movie, which I like. Romeo plus Juliet. Yeah, I like that movie. Right. It's 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 90s California as fuck. <laughs> um, it is it, it's it's really interesting when children are in movies and it says introducing uh, this child like as the, they are being introduced to the world because it's their first movie. Um, I find it very fascinating to sometimes look up these children and see what they've done since. Yeah. Um, uh, Paul Terry, uh, James in this movie. Um, he's done this movie. He did apparently a 26 episode children's sitcom in the late nineties. Um, and then he went and got a degree in civil engineering is now a math teacher. Oh, well, they good for him. <laughs> it's it, it's like, and I feel like I, I see that a lot where like child actors will like do a handful of things and then they just go on to have a, like a person life. Yeah. Um, there was a neat little fact I didn't want to bring up in relation to uh, Susan Sarandon being in this movie. Um, so Susan Sarandon's ex-husband, Chris uh, Sarandon, mm-hmm. uh, was the speaking voice for Jack Skellington. Oh. But but they divorced like back in like 1980, I think. So it's just I think it's just coincidence. Yeah. I don't know. I just I thought that was kind of neat. Um. I, I, speaking of Pete Postlethwaite, real quick, um, this movie is just like full of conveniences, and the fact that Pete, uh, the narrator or the Magic Man, uh, is a load of crock and bullshit. <laughs> yeah, he literally shows up out of nowhere, knows James everywhere, does not explain why he knows him. Um, gives him a mag, a, a, a bag of magic worms, I guess. Um. He said what they were, but he like started it's like run- some big, long-winded explanation. Yeah, what they actually are. And when I uh, honestly, I kind of laughed because of how fucking ridiculous it was. I like that he gives uh, James this big speech about like you know you got to take care of these things. Like if you if you if you drop <laughs> these, they'll immediately uh, latch on to, to whatever they find first and like turn it into something or whatever. Just uh, it, is, it, is, it is not t- 10 seconds later. That James turns around immediately beefs it and <laughs> spills these worms all over the goddamn place. Like yeah. 
not even 10 seconds, man. And you immediately fuck this up. I mean, man. it all works out in the end, but I just, I found it very fun. Yeah, know. It's just, it is, it is not even like any time to breathe between that conversation and him fucking up. Yeah. Uh. Um, yeah, this this movie is like it's it's bizarre. It's it's very strange. Just it is it is bizarre. But there there are just like a handful of things that like ma- actually made me laugh, um, for really fucking stupid reasons in this movie. Um, I I don't know why, and it, fu- it like it killed me at the end. Um, where James is like introducing all the bugs to to the New Yorkers. Oh, and they have a like, um, spotlight on him. Yeah, no, and I, I don't know why this makes me laugh, but he, and he's like, uh, he gets to the end and he introduces the glow worm who, you know, is like this fucking delusional old lady. And the first what she says is like, God bless the colonies. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it was like, I don't know why that makes me laugh, but that fucking killed me. And I think it was mo- I think it was partly because she like just says it in this like loony old lady voice. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> did you know this movie has a post credit scene? I did not. I did stay after the credits because Disney gave me a skip. Uh, Disney Plus gave me a skip credits option. I'm like, I wonder. Uh, yeah. And I watched the after credits scene for the first time in my life. Yeah. And it's just like this little like animation of like uh the ants uh it's like you know, a little can... it's like a little coin operation game that you can like control this little uh rhino. you know gear controlled rhino to like buck the ants yeah just to hit them right in the ass like yeah it's just interesting like uh, I, I i i don't know if nightmare had something like that i don't think nightmare had a post credit i don't scene, think nightmare right? has an after credits no yeah but i know like all the Leica movies do. So like, I know Coraline does. So as far as Selleck is concerned, it's just interesting because back in that day and back in that time, after credits were not a common thing. As far as I know, the most well-known one I can think of was, uh, it's like Ferris Bueller. Cause that's the one of her, like he's, right, you know, yeah. you know, the movie's over, go home, you know, that sort of, but thing. really after credits, I feel like didn't really start becoming more of a common thing until like, you know, Marvel started doing it. Yeah. So now, at least now like the like, last. Now thing. it's like almost commonplace. Like it's weird if you don't have one. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, it's, that was just an interesting thing too. Cause that's, that's something I, I didn't expect, but I checked anyway. And then like, yeah, when I, cause I didn't see a skip intro or a skip a credits button. I just sort of fast forwarded on Disney plus and I saw, Oh shit. There was like a little bit of footage left. I was wondering what the hell it could be. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, it was just uh, interesting to see that. Um, yeah, I don't know. As far as Henry Selleck movies go, and I mean, you know, there's not that many. Unfortunately, you know, I feel like he should have gotten a lot more of his projects made. And of course, you know, I get why not. If if a lot of his movies were, you know, not doing financially as well as you know the studios hoped and stuff. But I don't know. I I always really enjoyed his movies. Uh, this one is still. Like up against Nightmare and Monkey Bone and Coraline, um, I would at least for me personally, I would put it like at the bottom of that list. But I do still really enjoy it. There's still a lot of stuff that I, I do like about it. But I don't know. I think just between the um, between the very short runtime and I think you know the live action stuff's fine. But like you know, it's it's there for like budgetary reasons. Obviously, you know, I feel like if they could have done the whole movie stop motion, they would have. Yeah. Um, yeah. If, and it's weird because I, you know, with how with how well Nightmare did, you think they would have been allowed to, you know, splurge a little bit? But you know, I guess they've been trying to get this movie made since like '92 or something. I gotta remember that Nightmare was not as popular when it came out as it is today. No. Oh, yeah. That that is was it definitely, really not? No. no yeah. It. Was it, not. it Oh, it, sure. it, honestly, it's kind of like Zim where like, I feel like it wasn't until Hot Topic grabbed a hold of it that it yeah. really uh, blew up into popularity. Oh, shit. Um, I, fa- I found a very weird piece of trivia here. Um, one of the production companies on this movie is called Skellington Productions, uh, which is just a production company co-owned by Selick and Burton. Yeah, they only um, did the two movies. 
Well, no, I bring this up because but, uh, they did Nightmare, they did James and the Giant Peach, they did a movie with Chris Elliott called Cabin Boy. I'm not oh, sure what that... Oh my god, yeah, that's right. There's fucking stop motion sequences in that movie. Um, and uh, the, the thing I... the What I wanted to actually bring up about this is the last thing that they did <laughs> was the first season of the Life with Loopy shorts for Kablam! <laughs> Wait, the Skellington Productions did that? I, I read yes. that. I read that earlier, and I thought it was somebody that worked for Skellington Productions that had did their they, own they produced those something. segments. Oh shit! I find I, that hilarious. Well, now I know that whoever did the life with whoever headed the life with the Loopy shorts actually had their own show later too. I'm not sure. If maybe yeah, it was like some weird like uh, like paranormal investigation show. Yeah. Um, Ah, shit, the uh, name's on the t- to my tongue. I can't remember. Um, but Stephen yeah, no. Uh, what was it? Stephen Holman. Oh, was that the head? Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I- I'm going to look it up while we're talking here. But yeah, no, it's... Um, yeah, unfortunately, you know, with, with uh, James not doing well, I you know, obviously, Disney wouldn't go on to do any more stop motion until... Um, until 2012 with the, you know, the, uh, with the Tim Burton's Frankenweenie. Oh yeah. Cause, uh, you know, obviously I, I, Tim Burton did a stop motion movie before that in corpse bride, which I think came out in 2005. Uh, but that wasn't through Disney. That was through, um, uh, I'm actually not sure. I can't remember at the time I had, um, um sure. Yeah, shit. I can't remember, but yeah, yeah no, that's, um, and then shit. I, his, has uh, has Disney done stop motion since Frankenweenie? I can't remember. Uh, I don't think so. Frankenweenie was like what? When did that come out? 2012. Yeah, they've definitely been on a strictly CG uh, path since then. Well, and live action remakes of right. <laughs> oh, but I, de- so- I honestly, I honestly, just because of Burton is why they did stop motion for that. Yeah. Um. Apparently, at least like the reports that I read, like go back a couple of years. So I don't know if this is still happening, but with Disney doing all these live action remakes of their animated features and stuff, apparently James and the Giant Peach is was or was or might potentially still be one of those IPs that's supposed to be getting um, redone in live action. It was uh, apparently they have Sam Mendes uh, tapped a direct who is mostly known for. Uh, American Beauty and the 007 movies Skyfall and Spectre, mm-hmm. um, which is uh, interesting to say the least. But like, I don't know. I feel like a lot of the a lot of this movie's charm is the hybrid stuff between the like the live action and the and the the stop motion. I feel like it's not going to be, and it's it's I guess it's the case really with all those like live action remakes, uh, like you know Lion King and Aladdin and uh, oh, yeah. like Cinderella and stuff. It's once you once you translate that stuff sort of just into pure live action, it just it definitely loses like a lot of its charm. You know, um, I don't know exactly because you know, like a good chunk of James is live action, but I don't know. I don't know. I, I, It'll be interesting to see if they actually do go through that. I doubt they will, just because there's probably not much, uh, much interest in that. Not mm-hmm. that there's interest in the other stuff too, but I feel like that James is not going to be as well known a property to you know redo as you know any of the ones that they've done so far, like you know, like Jungle Book or yeah, like Lion King or any of the other shit. Yeah, we'll see. I guess we will have to see. And uh, if they yeah. end up doing that, I'm sure. Well, that 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 would be like the one live action thing like I'd be interested in checking out just because it's such a weird like in comparison to those other movies, it would be like a weird offbeat one to do. Yeah, they could they could change that up a bit, if, especially if they admitted stuff from the book, they could uh, kind of add some stuff back in. Yeah. And then, of course, you know, any of the shit that um, Netflix has planned for like its big slate of like Roald Dahl adaptations wants to do, I'm assuming that there's, you know, James will factor in that somehow as well. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Uh, that'll, we'll just have to wait and see. Yeah. Well, Kyle, is there anything you want to say about this movie? Okay. What'd you say? He said, this is fine. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I mean, yeah, guys, uh, this movie's kind of weird. If you haven't watched it in a while, I think it's, 
interesting at, at least from a couple different aspects but uh I don't know. It's just, it's a, it's a strange oddity. Uh, it's very Henry Selleck in a lot of ways. So, I mean, if you're a big fan of his, then I mean, I'm sure you would enjoy this or have enjoyed it in the past. Watch it and then p- cleanse your palate with the monkey bone. Oh God. <laughs> oh Jesus. All right. Well, before this gets, no. Okay. Uh, thanks for listening, everybody. Uh, we'll be back again next week with something else. But until then, everybody stay safe. Uh, yeah, we'll see uh, you next time. And don't forget, you can catch us on Twitter, Facebook, Discord. We're on YouTube. I got, on... I got, I got Justin at the end of the episode that says all that stuff. No, I want to say it. I'm, I'm, all right. I want to say it. No, I, I want to say it. You're right. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Bye. Thanks for listening. You can find all the links to our social media pages in the episode description. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and join our Discord. You can listen to us wherever you get your podcasts. The Ink and Paint Club is happy to be part of the Geekly Grind Podcast Network. We'll see you next time.